On the evening of April 13, 1970, NASA's Apollo 13 crew was 200,000 miles from home, hurtling through space and closing in on their target, the moon. Apollo 13 should have been the third time charm, but it wasn't. No one could believe that an explosion that disastrous had happened. Once the CO2 crisis is over, everyone immediately turns their attention to the biggest challenge of all, navigation. Apollo 13 is still heading straight for the moon. Somehow, they must change their course to a return to Earth trajectory, or the entire crew will perish. The only option is to push, using the lunar module's descent engine, a risky maneuver that had never been tested. So there was some point between the explosion and the realization that their only way home was to push, that we had to start doing those simulations. The lunar module was equipped with the same navigation and guidance system as the command module, but with different software. Engineers who designed the system weren't sure if the LEM would be able to handle navigation for the entire spacecraft in powered flight. As soon as it happened, as soon as we learned the problem, you know, immediately the question was asked me, can your simulator simulate the lunar module pushing the command module back home? The lunar module was controlling the combination of the command module and, and the service module. So that was the biggest challenge for that mission is that we had to work out in real time new algorithms. We had to answer the question, when the lunar module fires its engine to push the command module, is the whole thing going to break in half and fly apart? Nobody comes home. There is, there is no recovery. We didn't have two weeks, we didn't have a day. You know, we had hours. So doing the simulation was kind of important. They wanted to know if it was going to work. We ran all sorts of tests. We didn't have a lot of time, I and mean, that happened and there was a, you know, essentially a day to get all sorts of analysis and testing done. As the astronauts close in on the moon, ground engineers calculate various options to get them home. Each carries its own risk, and they are running out of time. Flight directors Gene Krantz and Chris Kraft pick the option that requires two major trajectory corrections powered by the LEM descent engine. The crew is able to transfer the command module's navigation platform to the LEM. But first, the LEM's navigation system must be realigned. The computer could tell us actually how to get back home if we had a problem en route to the moon. I had to manually and look outside to see the stars and then move the spacecraft around and then try to get the star into the optics and so that I could do the alignment that way. Ordinarily, the spacecraft uses star points and the onboard navigation and optics system to align the spacecraft for mid-course maneuvers. But Lovell must do it by eye, manually, through the ship's window. Take a look. We'd like to know if you can see stars for alignment purposes. No, we're not able to. Whatever debris came away uh, at the time of the uh, mishap uh, is still with us, but, but uh, we do have the uh, Earth and Moon, and that could be of assistance. Explosion debris swirling outside the spacecraft makes it impossible to sight real stars, so Lovell uses the Sun instead as an alignment star. Luckily, Commander Lovell is the only astronaut uniquely trained for this difficult task because of a mistake he made just over a year earlier as a navigator on Apollo 8. Push the wrong button, actually telling the computer and the guidance system that we we're back on the launch pad. So uh, we had to manually then go look at the stars and uh, realign the platform, which uh, we successfully did. A year or so later on Apollo 13, when we had to turn off our computer, turn off our guidance system to save power, 
I was uh, pretty confident that I could get our alignment back again, and basically because of the, the training I had inadvertently on Apollo 8. With the navigation system aligned, the crew prepares to change course for home. This is Apollo Control. At the present time, the Flight Dynamics Officer here in Mission Control is computing a maneuver to place Apollo 13 back on a free return trajectory. The alignment with the sun proves to be less than one half a degree off, giving the crew confidence they can execute the life-saving burn necessary to get them on course for Earth. What do you got? Get ready, upper right corner to front. What do you got? Uh, you just done the Aquarius? Go ahead, Aquarius. Okay, it looks like the fun checks out. We understand it checks out. We're kind of glad to hear that. It had no attitude reference. The inertial guidance system was not on. And so they were trying to steer that whole conglomeration, the command module and the LEM, steer the whole thing so that they could do the mid-course correction in the right direction. And the only thing they could do was look out the window of the LEM and try to hold it steady. A 35-second burn allows Apollo 13 to swing around the moon onto a free return to Earth course. One of the most impressive things that they were able to do was to target that trajectory and burn and actually control the vehicle to get back to that trajectory by hand. That, to me, is one of the most amazing things. About 18 hours later, after rounding the far side of the moon, they initiate the second burn to speed up their return. An enormous relief when the burn happened and it didn't come apart. Uh, just an incredible sense of relief. While the world waits, the crew is on their way home. Strict food and water rations, freezing temperatures, and condensation forming all over makes it a difficult two and a half day journey. Sleep is virtually impossible. So the three days coming back were nerve wracking because they had to, they had to just survive. As the crew approaches re-entry to Earth, they crawl back into a cold, dark command module to make sure they can restart the guidance system. We were forced to shut that system down with no power. It was never designed to do that. The critical components of the guidance system are the computer and an inertial measurement unit with stabilizing gyroscopes. The inertial system was a crucial element. The gyros were filled with fluid, and the fluid had to be maintained at like 154 degrees Fahrenheit. The gyroscopes were exposed to a drastic drop in temperature as a result of power failures after the explosion. The worst fear is they wouldn't start when you turn them on. And if you did turn them on, did you have enough performance to even get into the entry corridor? Engineers needed to test the gyroscopes on Earth and quickly report results to mission control. The one thing that we, we did was to take guidance systems and shove them in the freezer you know, while this was all going on, uh, just to figure out what, what might happen. Here at the laboratory, we did days of testing. and we put them in refrigerators, put them in car trunks, then brought them in to test them, to start them, and uh, see what kind of performance we could get. Most of the time they worked, but once in a while they didn't. So there was always an element of doubt. There was a big question whether Jaros would even turn on. Ready, ready, start power. It is okay. go time. The crew attempts to power up the All command right. module. Go with the primary. Okay, yaw one. Good. This one. Okay. And it works. But as the spacecraft nears re-entry, ground tracking detects an unexpected change in trajectory. This could spell disaster for the crew. Very critical because we're too shallow. Uh, we would skip off like skipping a stone on water. If it was too steep, the sudden acceleration would make us a fiery meteor for just a few seconds and that would be it. Mission Control decides to do one last course correction. Uh, appear to be possibly taking us away from the uh, place we know we want to be in the ball. Once again, they turn to Jim Lovell, the only astronaut uniquely qualified from his time aboard Apollo 8. One of the things they trained on 
was, was how you'd restart the navigation fix in the computers while coming back to Earth. It was a program that if we had lost uh, our guidance system completely and we're coming back, how can we make a, a, a final maneuver to sort of get back uh, into the proper position to make a safe landing? Using the LEMS attitude control rockets, Lovell performs a manual burn to make sure they hit their re-entry target. Uh, and so on eight, he did it. Uh, and the only other time they used that type of reinitialization of the navigation system was on 13. And they happened to have the one person who was experienced in doing it on board the vehicle with Jim Lovell. It was an emergency procedure, but it came in pretty handy on Apollo 13 when that was the way we made our final maneuver to get back into the Earth's atmosphere. Four hours before landing, the crew faces their next hurdle. Command module has to separate from the service module. It wasn't known that the separation was going to work. But it does. As the module drifts away, the crew is able to photograph the wreckage, revealing just how lucky they are. And that's when we saw this incredible explosion on the side of the service module. And there's one whole side of that street missing. Is that right? And the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, base to the uh, engine. It's really a mess. Man, that's unbelievable. No one could believe that an explosion that disastrous had happened. Three hours later, the crew leaves the Lunar Module Aquarius for good and prepares for the last hurdle. They jettison their lifeboat and brace for a fiery re-entry down a narrow corridor. So it had three cold astronauts in it, but it just re-entered flawlessly like it had been trained to do. Moments later, with the entire world watching, they splash down gently in the Pacific Ocean near Samoa. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the main. It really looks great. Apollo 13 did not land on the moon. But thanks to the incredible efforts of its crew and the tremendous ingenuity of experts on the ground, the astronauts made it safely home.